Support for Amplified Voices comes from the Restorative Action Foundation. Learn more at restorativeactionalliance.org. Everyone has a voice, a story to tell. Some are marginalized and muted. What if there were a way to amplify those stories, to have conversations with real people in real communities, a way to help them step into the power of their lived experience? Welcome to Amplified Voices, a podcast lifting the experiences of people and families impacted by the criminal legal system. Together, we can create positive change for everyone. Hello and welcome to another episode of Amplified Voices. I'm your host, Jason, here with my co-host, Amber. Hi, Amber. Good morning, Jason. Today we have Nick Dubin. Hi, Nick. Hey, Jason. How are you? We're doing great. So let me start with the same first question we typically ask people, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about your life before you got involved with the criminal legal system and what happened to bring you in? Well, before I was involved in the criminal legal system, I was very involved in autism advocacy. I had received my formal diagnosis in 2004, but I had displayed all kinds of signs since childhood. When I was three years old, I was completely nonverbal. I was jumping and flapping my hands like a seal. I was not playing with other kids. I'll give you another example. When my parents took me to the park when I was three and a half, I used to go up and down a slide. And if other kids even came near me, I would like totally freak out. I think I thought in my mind that that slide was my property. And so if the other kids came near me, it was like, no, don't get near me. This is mine. This is mine. But I didn't even have the vocabulary to express it because I didn't have language at that age. So I had nonverbal behaviors that typically resulted in meltdowns, as you would call them in autism vernacular. So I had that. And then I had a lot of different social issues and quote unquote learning disabilities growing up where I was in special ed from K-12. So it's not like the autism diagnosis was, oh my God, I've never known something was different about me until this very moment in time. There was a lot leading up to it. And once I finally got the diagnosis, it made perfect sense. You're from Michigan. Did you grow up right in that Detroit area? Yeah, I'm a homeboy from Detroit. I've always lived in Michigan. And with the exception of one year when I went away my freshman year to Grand Valley State University, I've always lived in the Detroit area. I came from a very, very loving and good home. And my dad's a law professor at the University of Detroit, Mercy. He's retired now, but he's an emeritus. And my mom is still a playwright and she teaches playwriting at Oakland University. So they're both very educated. They're into the arts. They gave me an appreciation for the arts when I was a young age, which I feel is a great thing to have. And I've always had a great relationship with them. I feel very lucky in that way. How did the autism affect your schooling or your relationships with kids as you were growing up? Oh, it had a huge effect. The older one gets, the more of an effect it actually has. So in elementary school, I had two or three friends. But once you get to middle school, things become a lot less structured. Your parents aren't calling the other parents for play dates. You are the one that takes the initiative. And when you start to get into middle school, And you feel a little younger than your actual age, but your peers are still aging chronologically and developmentally, but you don't feel like you are hitting those milestones. And I couldn't have articulated it like that back then, but that's how I feel now looking back on it. Middle school became very, very difficult. I started getting bullied a lot for being different, for liking different music, for having different behaviors, you know, for pacing back and forth in the classroom and just having certain repetitive behaviors. Almost every autistic person I've ever met has been bullied. That's the one thing most autistic people have in common. And that was true for me. And it was very hard to make and keep friends. And got to tell you, that's kind of been a theme throughout my life. No, I'm so sorry you went through that. And it's such a shame. Not only did you suffer, but so many people missed out in having you as a close friend. I think there's a myth that if you're nice, you're automatically going to be liked. You don't know how many people I know on the spectrum who are really nice people, and they try so hard to fit in. 
no matter what they do, it just doesn't work for them. And the harder they try and the nicer they try to be, the more banana peels they slip on. So it's not about being nice. It's just about missing a few things and not reading the picture. Nick, I really appreciate you sharing this experience. We do have a family member who is on the spectrum and having a name for it was helpful. Did you find that to be true? Absolutely. I mean, I went through my whole life struggling to understand what was going on with me. And what really brought about the diagnosis was a failed work experience. And that's been the case, I think, with a lot of people that I've talked to. I was in a master's program and I started student teaching and I just realized that I was overwhelmed. I couldn't multitask. I couldn't do everything that was being asked of me. Three weeks went into the program and basically everybody came together. The cooperating teacher I was working under, the principal, and they just said, you know, this isn't for you. You're a good guy. You've worked hard in the program. I was going to graduate magna cum laude had this part of it worked out. This wasn't the only failure I had in my life. I had a lot of other things that just didn't go like I thought they would. And I wanted to understand it. And I didn't want to just self-diagnose myself. I wanted to get it checked out by a professional. And then I even went to another professional at the time for a second opinion. I just wanted to have an explanation so that I didn't go down paths in the future that were going to lead to dead ends. I wanted to understand what are my strengths, what am I good at, and what are my weaknesses. And the diagnosis really helped me to understand that I really had uneven development. Most people's development, their verbal skills, their emotional intelligence, yes, we all have strengths and weaknesses, but it's pretty well correlated. In individuals with autism, people can be really strong in certain areas and just have some struggles in others. And I didn't really understand that about myself. And I think having a professional give me the diagnosis as opposed to diagnosing myself, being able to put the name to the diagnosis was very helpful to me. We'll get into how you've written some books later, but you became a student of autism. Is that where that started? That's exactly where that started. And that's what prompted me to go into the psych program where I got a doctoral degree. But I knew going into that program that I could not do the therapy aspect of it. So I went in and I disclosed to them. I just learned that I had autism from another program that I didn't do so well. And I was honest with them about this. Here I am applying for a a program and I'm admitting a failure, but I felt I needed to do this. And I said, I want to do what every other student is doing, but I know I'm not going to be seeking a license because a license would mean practicing psychotherapy. And that's just not where my strengths are. I really want to be more of an educator and a writer and an author on autism related issues. Maybe I would teach at a university someday. That was my aspiration. Actually, I wanted to teach somewhere. And you need a higher degree to get in the door at a university or a college. And I let them know that. And they said, okay, we'll think about it. I didn't think they were going to accept me based on that disclosure. But I heard about four or five days later, I did get into the program. And I think learning some of the things that I learned in class helped me to write those books. So you did ultimately complete the doctoral program and you are a PhD. Is that correct? I'm a PSYD, but I don't have a license and I never did have a license, but I did write my dissertation and I did complete the program. That is kind of what was on the edge right before I came into the criminal legal system. I had just completed the program a year before, and then my entry into the criminal legal system happened a year later. Did you find, because you were so high functioning, that some of the myths that are pervasive about autism and high functioning autism affected the way people interacted with you? So, for instance, what I see is with high functioning autism, people may interact with individuals and say, well, that person's just strange or they have quirks or whatever, but they couldn't have autism because they're so intelligent or they're so high functioning. Did you find that that myth kind of affected the way people interacted with you? People who didn't know me that well, yes. People who got to know me, no. It's like running a marathon for me. The more social I have to be, the more I tire out easily. And so I may run three miles and get kind of tired where somebody can run the marathon and get tired towards the end. So I can mask it, but then when things change or there's unexpected changes to the schedule or 
a curveball is thrown at me that would normally not affect a neurotypical, that kind of throws me into a meltdown. And somebody might say, are you okay, man? You know, it's my autism. So I've been able to learn ways to mask behavior to kind of look neurotypical at times. But if you really strip it down to the bare bones, and if you could see me when something changes in the schedule, or when I have to adjust to something or things like that, it's pretty apparent to anybody who's familiar with it. Thanks for being so open about that. So then this is where we get to the moment. Yeah, this is where we get to the moment. I had graduated my program and had a PSYD. I had taken a job as the dean of students at a local autism high school. And this was a new school that had opened up for individuals on the spectrum who had autism. It was a pretty new concept. And I was asked to be brought in. I didn't even apply for this job. They knew of me because of my work and because of my speaking and my writing. To be honest, I was hesitant because I'm always hesitant when it comes to my abilities. I had the student teaching experience in my mind and I didn't want another failure. But on the other hand, I thought to myself, okay, these are people with autism. I have autism. I think I can really provide insight. A lot of the teachers at the school, they did not have autism training. They had just completed their general education curriculum. And the principal of the school didn't really hire specialists in autism, which I thought was kind of odd. So he brought me in to kind of coordinate trainings and work with the teachers and help them to understand that. A month into the job goes by, that's when it all happens. Okay, so it sounds like an ideal work environment for you, but it only lasts a month. So what happened? It actually had lasted for about nine months because of a lot of the prep that went in working with the principal. But the actual job when the school year started only lasted a month. What happened essentially was that one morning at 6.30 in the morning, I was in bed and my dog, who I had gotten about seven, eight months earlier, named Sadie, was lying next to me. And she started getting up and pacing around the room. And That was very uncharacteristic for her. Normally, she didn't have to go out until 9 or 10, and this was like 6.30. So it looked like she was alarmed, and I looked at her, and then I could hear noises, and I sleep with no sound machines. So it's not like I can hear everything that's going on, and my sound machines are always turned way, way up so I can drown out the noise outside. So with my sound machines blasting, I could hear like thumping going on in the living room, and I thought somebody had broken into my place. I didn't know why they were there. I could see through the heating and cooling vents what looked like lights. So I knew someone was in my place and I actually thought I was going to die. And then the door barged open. Flashlights were shown in my face. So I didn't really even catch the badge of the FBI, but they were in there and dragged me out of bed, threw me against the wall cuffed me until they had the place cleared, put me on my couch in the living room, and then explained or actually asked me, do you want to tell me why we're here? And really, the only thing that I could think of was what I had done, which was I had downloaded illegal images. Once I saw the FBI, I I had said what I had done. And that's pretty much what happened that morning. So it sounds like a pretty terrifying experience. And you just said, I thought I was going to die. It just gives an insight to people on kind of how arrests are made and how things pan out. At the time, my world was very small. My interests were very small. You know, I did have a PSYD in psychology, but I just wasn't aware of doing something in private leading to, and I'm not minimizing that when I say that because there were real victims involved and real people in those images. But The idea that something that I was doing in the privacy of my home could have led to what that led to was absolutely outside of my scope of understanding until it happened. And then once it happened and I was quickly able to get into therapy, it hit me like a ton of bricks what I had done and how horrible it was and how much contrition I had and what I had contributed to because I had seen it as a private thing and that really was the wrong way to view it. And there's one more thing that I wanted to bring up along these lines that I think is really important and that I'm just thinking about now as I talk. And that is, I really had a very confused sense of my sexuality growing up. And that was something that was never addressed. 
I tried to address it in my late adolescent years, my freshman year of college. I had been feeling attraction to peers, but that thought at the time was so abhorrable to me because as you remember in the 90s, being gay and coming out in adolescence was not something that was easy to do. And I just didn't know if I was gay or was I just immature and I didn't understand what was going on. So I attempted to come out to my parents who are very understanding people and are not homophobic, but they just saw that I had all these problems on my plate at the time. And I think responded with compassion, but said to me, how can you be sure that you're gay? You don't know. You haven't had experience with the opposite sex. You have to try dating men and women, and then maybe you'll know what you truly are as far as your orientation. It actually, you know, wasn't helpful. I don't blame them for saying that, but it confused me. And the autism itself didn't make it very easy to go out on dates. And therefore, I kept it all inward. And as a result of that, used pornography as a way to kind of have that be the vehicle to learn about my sexuality. So the vast majority of the pornography that was found on my computer was of adult males. And I think the one good thing that's come out of this episode is that I've been able to kind of acknowledge to myself, yes, I am gay. That's not so horrible. That's actually part of who I am. Before 2010, that was not a part of my identity. Well, actually it was, but it wasn't something I wanted to acknowledge about myself. Now it's part of who I am and I'm okay with that. I recognize how difficult it is for you to talk about not only the traumatic experience of them coming in, but also what you went through. Not a lot of people come forward and talk as openly as you are. And I think it's important to share some of what was going on in your thought process for other people to hear that. Because in your mind at the time when you were downloading these images originally, you didn't realize you were hurting anybody. No, I really didn't make the connection between what I'm doing is actually causing harm to another person. In my mind, it was I'm sitting at a computer looking at a screen. I'm not hurting these people. That is how I viewed it. And it's wrong. It's not the right way to view it. But once it was drilled into me that this is the byproduct of somebody looking at these images and what you're contributing to, yeah, the sense of guilt and shame obviously was overwhelming, completely overwhelming and overwhelms me to this day. Although I've worked hard at trying to not be totally overcome by it. It is really admirable and we appreciate so much you sharing the process. I think that people have a hard time understanding how these things happen. There are a lot of different ways to look at things and 100% understanding that this is something that contributes to the harm of people is step one. Right. And it seems like you went through that journey, you went through that process, and it was very important to you that you understood what had happened and worked through why it happened. Absolutely. And part of that journey for me was being able to put that into writing. And I actually wrote a book about it with two other people who are doctors in the autism field. Tony Atwood, who's very well known as far as autism and Asperger's and Isabel Hanal. At the time I wrote that book and was just putting thoughts into paper, I really didn't know that this was a problem beyond me as far as autistic people and the vulnerabilities that they may face. It was just a first person perspective. And something that I wanted to put out into the universe. And I thought, if it can help other people, great. If it's just for myself, then so be it. And what ended up happening was after that book came out, which was in 2014, my dad was mentioned as being a law professor. All of a sudden, people are looking up his email address, and he's getting tons of emails from parents and family members and spouses and children. And he's probably gotten over 400 emails over the past seven years from parents who have been in the same situation as my parents were. And that's when I knew, obviously, this is not just me. When I've come across all these other people and their stories and how they line up to mine and how similar they were as far as what they went through and their testing, and I'm able to see how they tested neuropsychologically, it's pretty stunning that all the stories line up. That's what made me decide to initially speak out about this. It was just like I was seeing it left and right. It's why an organization like Elrid was formed because there was a need for it. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been all these parents that came together and 
said, um, we're hurting here. Our children, you know, are not bad people. They missed something. They had a blind spot and they're going to be on the registry. And I don't think these parents think the registry is right for anyone, not just their children, but anyone. That's the sense I get from the organizers. So it's not just me. And I want to also make one more thing clear. When I say this, I'm not trying to say that autistic people are more dangerous. In fact, the opposite. They're rule followers. I'm a rule follower. But we have to know what the rules are, and it has to make sense to us. And then once we do, we follow the rules to a T. A couple quick things I want to point out, and then we can move ahead. You mentioned Al Ridd. I just want to mention that we had a great conversation with Carol Nastikis in one of our other episodes, and she's part of Elred. So I want to just make sure we highlight that point. She has a heartbreaking story about her family and her son. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you, eventually we're going to talk about what your life has been like in terms of the impacts, but I want to get to right now the therapy that you had that got you to that point. When I initially was arrested, they put me in a pretrial therapy group. I was seeing my individual therapist at the same time. I had been seeing him before the arrest, but also was put into this pretrial group. And immediately I could tell that this group encroached upon privacy issues because it was pretrial. They were trying to coax things out of people before their actual plea hearing. I just thought the whole thing was not good for a pretrial setting. And my lawyers moved for me to be moved into individual therapy, which was granted by the court. So that's really where I did the work with my individual therapist. You know, I've seen him twice a week now for the past 11 years since the arrest. So I've been in therapy twice a week for the last 11 years. And that's where I've gained my insight from him. And he was the one who I was eventually allowed to stay in therapy with post arrest as well, instead of the group therapy, which by the way, from Elbert parents, I've heard so many horror stories about as far as their children being in the group. And they're not understanding the group dynamics of what's taking place. And they're hearing about horrible things that have happened. And it's just not part of their experience. And they don't feel like they're gaining anything from the group setting. If anything, it's more traumatic to them than therapeutic. And so I think the therapy is really important. I think for autistic people, it has to be in a specific structured way. It's not just a one size fits all. It's very, very important when we talk about how somebody is going to respond to therapy. Is that therapy helping them? So in circles of experts and whatnot, this is what they called the risk needs and responsivity. And this is that responsivity part of it in terms of how is somebody going to respond? What are the risks? What are the needs of that person? And how are they going to respond to the model that's being used? And what we do find is for those places that do have mandated and they don't have a lot of diversity or different modalities, if you will, people get lost and they fall through the cracks. And it's, as you mentioned, much more damaging to them. Yeah. And for a lot of autistic people, they didn't commit the crime for maybe the same reason that the group leader is thinking they committed the crime for. And here they are thrown into this group, which basically focuses on containment and you are bad and you will always have these impulses. The autistic person is thinking, I'm bad. Okay, I'm bad. And they internalize it so easily because of how suggestible they can be. And so they're given this message, I'm bad. I will never get better. I will always have these thoughts and feelings. I need to monitor them. And then you combine that with the obsessive quality that autistic people already have. And that so they're thinking, okay, is this a bad thought? Is this a bad thought? Is this a bad thought? It makes it worse. It compounds the problem. What they need is individual guidance, education, psychoeducation, being able to be in a trusting environment, individual therapy, rather than throwing them in with a bunch of quote-unquote neurotypicals. Or if you're going to do group therapy, then at least put them with other autistic people and a counselor who has expertise in the area of autism. But these autistic people, some of whom don't even know what the sex offender registry is, are simply thrown into groups and it's totally counterproductive. And so then what happens next? I don't think you went to prison, did you? I was privileged in that I didn't. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I had very good attorneys. 
I had parents that were able to afford a good defense. I also had good experts who put forward actual reasons why I was, in their opinion, a low risk. And they also did a lot of testing and vetting out my history and asking a lot of questions that you're asking. What was your childhood like? Very detailed things. One even asked what my APGAR score was. So, I mean, it went into detail. They did a neuropsychological battery of tests. I was seen by a total of five experts and all five experts assessed me to be a low risk. They even recommended a diversion from the criminal justice system. They thought that was appropriate for me. I didn't get it, but that was the argument that was put forth by my defense team. No, I didn't go to prison, but obviously I had the collateral consequences of being on the registry. I am grateful, I have to say, I didn't go to prison. So those experts that you saw, were those experts that were brought in by your attorneys or where did those experts come from? Two of the experts were brought in by my attorneys. And then the prosecution at that phase was willing to make an offer. And my attorneys basically said, well, if you want to have any of your experts look at this young man. So they actually took us up on that. One of them was the victim assistance chief at the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was flown there. I had to have one of those big tethers going through security at the airport. It was very traumatic for me. But I was seen by the neuropsychologist, but he also was the head of the victim assistance program, which helped victims of child pornography. So he had skin in the game when it came to you know, helping victims. He thought I was a good candidate for diversion. Um, He had access to all the records, all my medical records, all my IEPs from my childhood, the previous reports that had been written by my two other defense experts. And he came to that conclusion. And then after that, I was seen by another prosecution expert who said diversion, I would be okay with that for this young man. Again, that wasn't what was adjudicated, but I didn't go to prison. 98% of people in the federal system who are arrested for this do actually serve a prison term. I would be disingenuous if I didn't say that I was grateful for not going to prison. This is an example of the way a system could work better if this were available to more people. So you didn't go to prison. You did serve time on probation and you were placed on the registry. So let's get into what your experience has been like, what was probation like, how were you treated, how has the outside world treated you, employment, all those things? You know, I don't want to make this too much of a sob story about poor me, but it's no secret that being on the registry is not easy. And I think when you have a developmental disability, it compounds that. And I feel like I'm speaking for the autism population when I speak for myself. This is more than just about me. This is about people who sometimes have the mentality of a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old, and you're basically giving a civil disability on top of what they already have, which is a developmental disability. And that totally throws away any second chance at life. So as far as employment, I've been restricted to writing books, giving a few talks about this, freelance writing, which I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed being a part of a community that I feel really gets it. I was recently asked to be on the board of directors of Elred, which I consider to be a huge honor because of the work that they're doing. Some of the bills that they've recently passed in Virginia have been extremely impressive. And I'm really supportive of that. When I was on probation, I just saw that it was part of this containment model where they would make a once a month visit, do inspections of every nook and cranny of my place and making sure nothing was there. And of course, I had software attached to my computer to make sure that nothing was downloaded. And I remember I told her that I was going to be playing tennis at a court with a friend of mine. And just coincidentally, she happened to be there the day I was playing tennis with her son. And it was kind of like, wow, am I that dangerous? Like Those were the thoughts that was going through my mind. I'm just here to play tennis and she's supervising it. So She kept in constant contact with my therapist and the model didn't work for me because after a few months, I had known how horrible my behavior was and I knew I was going to make a commitment to never doing it again. To me, it was all overboard because I had already experienced the accountability I needed and this thought that I'm this monster that can go out and harm at any time, I just thought was misplaced when it came to me. I am just going to put it out there. I'm not a fan of the containment model. I don't think that it's appropriate for anyone, much less anybody on the spectrum. 
So when you are modeling everything off the premise that somebody is a monster or that they're bad and you need to contain them and they need to contain themselves, when in fact there is a process whereby somebody can take accountability, work through and understand what next steps are, I'm more of a fan of having somebody build a life that matters enough to them to not do something that causes them to harm others. I'm just not a fan of the containment model at all. It is widely used, but I think we should be setting people up to succeed and giving them tools to do that. And the containment model is just not where it's at. I totally agree with you, Amber. I think it holds people back. It makes any work environment incredibly intrusive because the probation officer is showing up at that person's workplace. That often is not something that helps a person get a job. The person is thought to be a monster and they are totally internalizing those thoughts on a regular basis. And again, when you have an autistic person who already has obsessive tendencies to then be told you're a monster, you're a monster, and then believe it because I think there's a certain kind of suggestibility and gullibility, it's almost a recipe for reoffending. And that's not what we should be doing. I think we should be doing much more of what they do in Canada with the COSA model, with the good lives, things that can bring out the strengths, which we know autistic people have. They have inherent strengths and dignity. And the containment model just says, you messed up, you have these tendencies, and we don't care about your autism. We don't care about whatever talents you may have. We just want to make sure you're going to have as small a life as possible. And they're very good at doing that. They're very good at making sure that people feel that they can't achieve anything, even though they say, oh, yeah, we want you to achieve a lot in life. But it's their actions. It's their constricting actions, which make it very difficult. So I originally came across you, Nick, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And you had a very active Twitter presence. You shared something with me about a reporter in Detroit who was basically creating a moral panic around people who were on the registry who had not registered for whatever reason when they were supposed to. And she was making this big sensationalized story. I remember that pretty well. And then shortly after, you decided to leave Twitter altogether. Do you want to talk about why you made that decision? I think I just saw that Twitter was too overstimulating for me. There were a number of factors that went into play, but Twitter is a very overstimulating place where you're getting 3,000 people's opinions about everything you say and everything everyone else says. And I started experiencing some harassment on Twitter. Somebody made a parody account of me and apparently had gone through, you know, every portion of my life and had read previous books and were quoting passages from my books and Advocacy is important to me, but I really didn't need that. And I wanted to find a way to advocate in my own way. I do have a book that's coming out, and I feel that that's a way to advocate where I don't necessarily have to have a social media presence. To me, the most important thing in my life is having a good quality of life. And if Twitter is going to contribute to it negatively, then it's just not worth it. And a good quality of life, for me, being committed to be the best person I can be, that's essentially how I boil it down. I obviously missed the connections I made on Twitter, and I'm glad you and I are still able to be connected. But I just saw that it wasn't my forum. I, I didn't feel I was the best advocate to be able to say something in 180 characters. It just wasn't my format. I just came to that conclusion. I'm glad you shared that. The other question I have for you is, do you want to talk a little bit about the tennis experience? I had a friend who is kind of an older friend. He's a friend of my family. So I've known him since I was a kid. And we played tennis and he joined a tennis club nearby. And he said, I'd really like you to join. This is where I'm going to be playing from now on. I have a bad knee and I can't play on hard courts and they have clay courts here. And I'm like, this is probably a good thing for me to do. So I signed up, but I had reservations. You know, I hope this is not too social of a club. And it was a very social club. It was a club where all the members kind of knew everything about each other and what they did for a living. And did they make six figure incomes? And so I knew eventually that, you know, just saying I'm Nick Dubin wasn't going to cut it. And they'd ask about me and I would say I'm a freelance writer and I do such and such. And I actually enjoyed being a member while I was a member. I enjoyed 
having a good game and getting some wins under my belt. I hadn't played a lot. And then I played somebody and he asked me, I think, are you married? And I said, no. And, you know, aren't you looking for someone? And I'm like, well, not right now. And so apparently that sparked his interest in me because I answered those questions that way. And long story short, he Googled me. And of course, when you Google me, this comes up. And then he went to the management and then there was a big board of directors meeting. And this guy is a member of our club. What do we do? This club had no children, by the way. This was an adult club. It was a small private club. But because I was on the registry, they felt that I should tenure my resignation. And one thing I found out about that is there was a member of that club who was guilty of Medicare fraud. He had built millions and millions of dollars from patients and was about to head to prison. And yet he was a member until the day he had to self-surrender. Me, where I had completed my probation, I wasn't off to prison, but yet I'm not suitable to be a member. That was a very hurtful experience to go through. Obviously, because of the area of work we're in, I don't feel super surprised, but I can see how that is very harmful. And what we find in our own experiences as well is that you do take a leap of faith when you are joining any social group. You do have those thoughts, whether you're the person on the registry or you're the spouse or you're connected to someone on the registry. You say, is this something that I even want to do? because I know that this will eventually be a thing. So I can really relate to what you're saying. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. There is an unfairness to it because there is a lot of grace that is offered to people who have been through the criminal legal system or are involved in some way. But the carve out remains in our culture that If it's about this topic, if it's about sex offenses or anything like that, that's where the line gets drawn. Yeah. And it's very unfortunate because there are so many wonderful people who have so much to give that can be contributing to our communities that are held back by that. And I'm very sorry that that happened to you, Nick. I really appreciate that. And just to touch on your leap of faith thing, this is something that I actually talked about in therapy before I joined. I was against it. I was like, what do I do? Do I not disclose? He's like, no, you don't have to disclose. What does that have to do with tennis? There aren't going to be kids around there. You're just there to play tennis. They don't need to know about your life. You're not a danger. And I said, but it would be so easy for somebody to Google me. So I was against it. He's like, you need to have a life. Tennis is something you enjoy. This guy belongs to this club. He's offering that you join and that you and he would have games and you'd have games with others. So I was taking the advice of my therapist. I personally didn't want to do it. And so here I am trying to grow, take the advice of my therapist and look where it gets me. It's not like I came back and I said, I told you so, Dr. So-and-so, because I knew that it was a possibility and it was a leap of faith that just didn't pan out in this instance. And I would just add, your therapist was right. You should have gone to that club and you should have been able to remain a member and shame on every single one of those board members that kicked you out. Yes, it was shameful that that happened. Yes, the people should have thought through or been more educated. But I want to place blame where blame lies. And that is on a system that creates this. Because when you're running a public organization, even a private organization, it's your obligation to think that you're protecting the people that are involved. Yeah. And our government essentially says this person is so dangerous, they have to be on a public list. And we have created this whole system that allows this to happen. So on one hand, yes, the people who were involved did the wrong thing had they had all of the information and the education that they needed. However, the blame lies on a system that creates this and allows it to happen. That's awesome addition. Thank you, Amber, for that. And so just to take it back to some of the other collateral consequences, have you experienced other types of discrimination or other types of things? Are there things that you're just not doing because you're afraid that something similar could happen that happened at the tennis club? What has your life been like? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a deterrent factor when something like that happens. It's like a rat being shocked and then they're not going to go for the cheese again. There's almost like a behavioral effect that it has that you don't want to touch the hot stove to be burned. Yeah, I've had neighbors give me the finger and I'm pretty sure that 
big condominium complex where I live, folks know about my status. And again, I have to acknowledge my privilege in that I have it a lot better than a lot of other people do. And the fact that I have very loving parents, I live in a fairly nice setting, and I've had some help. I know a lot of people are not in that situation. Really, my heart goes out to them. I don't know if it's survivor's guilt, but I feel truly, truly bad. So I know I have some privilege, and I also know I've had it better than others, but it sucks. So all things can be true at the same time. It sucks. I've had some privilege, and I definitely feel there are things that I would be doing in the world if more doors were open to me and people were more accepting. And that would be not just beneficial to you, but beneficial to other people that you'd be interacting with. I think so. I mean, I think I would be more involved in the autism community itself. When this happened, the autism community, I'm not talking about parents or doctors or professionals, but the people in the community, those autistic individuals were very hard on me. And I could understand that. Nobody wants to be stigmatized in a negative way. And I totally got that. Almost immediately, I understood. Didn't make it feel good, (laughs) you know, from a personal standpoint, but I at least understood where they were coming from. So had it not been for this, I do think that I'd be more involved. And it's hard to imagine where I would be had this not happened 11 years ago. But I also think some good has come out of it in that I think I'm a better person, the fact that this happened. The fact that I'm not engaged in that behavior right now is a good thing. And that's something that will never happen again, as far as I'm concerned. So when's the book coming out? And tell us about it a little bit. The book is coming out in July. What I did is I looked at it from a 360 degree angle. I wanted to focus a chapter on prevention, what we can do to prevent autistic people from falling into the cracks and ending up in the system. So I focused a lot on sex ed curriculum and the best ways to design it for autistic people in an individualized way where maybe they're being mentored by somebody on the spectrum, as opposed to when I was in school, the very basic curriculum. And also the fact that autistic people, their parents don't often assume that they're sexual beings because they don't talk about it. You know, they have so many other issues to deal with that sex rarely comes up and it gets buried underground. That's wrong. And that's not the attitude that professionals should be having. So a chapter is focused on that. Then a chapter is focused on police interactions, which we see a lot about in the news as far as how people with disabilities and mental illness can be misunderstood by the police and ways to fix that. And then chapter three talks about, in general, the adjudication process. And I'm really trying to give lawyers some insight based on the seven or eight plus years that I've been helping families as to what can possibly help as some mitigating circumstances in general. Obviously, it's going to be different for each person. And then the last chapter is, as we talked about, Good Lives Model, COSA, alternatives to incarceration, showing some of the disastrous effects that some incarceration has had on autistic people when they inevitably end up in solitary. Their behavior is misunderstood by other inmates. I don't like the word inmates. Other people in prison. Their behavior is misunderstood by correctional officials and is perfectly innocent behavior, but they don't know it. And they get sent to the hole for 30 days and then deteriorate more. So I'm trying to shed a light on these issues. I think it's important, at least because I've been affected by it. And I know so many other people that have. So I just hope other people will be interested enough to take a look and internalize. You're exactly right. We do not have those conversations. We don't see that as something that they're going to encounter. And then, as you said, rule followers. So it's like, okay, this is how we interact. This is what consent means. This is appropriate relationships. And the rules are followed. There's a whole section on consent in the first chapter and ways to teach it specifically for the autism population because consent can be misunderstood. A lot of autistic people don't understand that consent is a fluid process. It's not like, you know, you decide at the beginning that it's going to happen and then the woman can't change her mind. For a lot of autistic people, it's like, okay, it's going to happen. And there's a lot of cognitive rigidity there. And it just needs to be addressed on an individualized level to prevent people from ending up in the system. So there's fewer victims and fewer perpetrators. That should be everybody's goal. A hundred percent. So Nick, tell us the name of the book. The book is called Autism Spectrum Disorders, Developmental Disabilities, and the Criminal Justice System Breaking the Cycle. 
And Nick Dubin is D-U-B-I-N, Nick Dubin. That's fantastic. I'm looking forward to reading it. And I see you've got a library of books behind you. What are you currently reading? Currently, I'm reading a book that you recommended, actually, which was We Do This Till We Free Us, which is a number of essays that are just brilliant. They're mind-blowing. And for people who aren't familiar with the concept of abolition, to me, it's a great introduction into that subject because I think a lot of people approach abolition from a scared point of view. Like, what are we going to replace it with? And I just think that this imagines all kinds of different possibilities as opposed to what we've been doing since the days of Jeremy Bentham and the invention of the modern day prison. Is there anything in your story that we didn't cover? I'm giving this interview, not because I want to talk about myself, but because of how I see this affects other autistic people. The podcast you gave with Carol Nastikas is a great example. If I understood correctly, her son doesn't even understand what the sex offender registry is, doesn't understand the concept of it, and yet is still forced to register. And I guess if I could say one thing and emphasize it enough is that there's uneven gaps with autism. You have autistic individuals who you would think would know better because on the one hand, they test so high in their IQ, but on the other hand, when their daily living skills are totaled and you can see other aspects of their daily living and their understanding of just social norms and conventions and things like that, it's just not there. And there can be such a gap between high IQ and daily living skills. So I think we're getting a little better at recognizing mental illness. We also need to recognize developmental disabilities. And I just hope that when it comes to the criminal legal system, my book is one step further in doing that. Awesome. Amber, do you have any more questions for Nick? I really don't have any other questions. I continue to be impressed by your work and I'm really looking forward to the book. I appreciate you wanting to make a difference for so many others, because that's really what our podcast is about, to share stories that can help people and amplify the experiences of people who have been affected by the criminal legal system, which really it's out there as a hammer and everything looks like a nail. So we need to be looking more at the nuances. And if there's a place to look at nuances, it's definitely with people on the spectrum. So thank you very, very much for being here today. And we look forward to working with you in the future. I'll just add that it was a pleasure to have you as a guest. And I just hope that the book does really well and that people read it because I think it will make a huge difference. I appreciate both you saying that. And I want you guys to also know that I appreciate the work you're doing. Your podcasts are amazing. The work you're doing in Connecticut with the Restorative Justice Alliance. I just think it's all awesome. So please keep up the good work, both of you. Absolutely. Until next time, Amber. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Amplified Voices, a podcast lifting the experiences of people and families impacted by the criminal legal system. For more information, episodes, and podcast notes, visit amplifiedvoices.show.